Hi folks, we'll begin the study in about three minutes. So uh, if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, prayer requests, leave them in the comments. Thanks. <clears throat> well, hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we'll be looking at the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. And uh, please feel free to send me any thoughts, ideas, questions, prayer requests. And uh, I think the best way for us to begin is as we always do with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that uh, you give it to us as light in our darkness, as a means by which we can see you and know you better. And Lord, we thank you for the other means of grace as well. We thank you not only for the word, but the word as it is conveyed to us in holy baptism and in holy communion. And Lord, we uh, pray at this time that we would be open to you and uh, we lift up our prayers to you for our world at this time, asking that you would bring um, healing and help to those who are ill, to those who are combating uh, COVID-19, and to all who are providing help to those who need help in these difficult times. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello there, Masons. Glad to see that you're here. Tonight we move on to John chapter 9, and here we're going to uh, begin with a story of one of my favorite people uh, in the Bible, um, a, a man whose name is never given to us, but uh, uh, gives a powerful witness for Jesus. So let's uh, begin. John chapter 9, verse 1. As he, that is Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, 
Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Hi, Nancy and Larry and Marianne. Good to see you here this evening. Glad you're able to be with us. This uh, is uh, a remarkable uh, sign, another one of Jesus' signs as uh, John calls them, pointing to who he is. But uh, it's interesting that this particular sign is not precipitated by uh, the person who is blind asking for sight. Um, it's not precipitated by anyone asking on his behalf. Um, Jesus uses this man as an object lesson uh, in a in a question that the disciples have asked him. The disciples ask, and apparently no one questions, that this man has been blind since birth. Hi, Linda. Uh, but the, the disciples ask, who sinned, this man, presumably in his mother's womb, or his parents that he was born blind? It was a common assumption among uh, Judeans among God's people in those days, that if someone experienced ill health or uh, a crippling condition, whatever it might be, that someone sinned. Hi, Don. And so uh, I'm not saying you sinned, Don. I just happen to see your name come, <laughs> come up when I, when I talked about the assumption that the Judeans made. And we see this in our culture too. People um, presume that when people have something terrible happen to them, it must be their fault in some way. You know, the old saying is those people shouldn't have been there anyway. Uh, that kind of idea. And uh, I talk about that in the message I link in the comments. Um, I think we say these kinds of things because um, we think legalistically, right? We forget that we are all in common subject to the ills that befall a human race that is fallen. You know, we are born, all of us, in this condition of sin. And that's a, a very important point to make. Um, we do not by nature believe in God. We believe in ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. We want to be in control of our own lives and so forth. That we're, we're like that from the time we um, are born. The sin also uh, um, expresses itself in the Gospel of John in the refusal to receive Jesus as the Messiah, as Yahweh in the flesh. <clears throat> so Jesus, there are some really bad translations of this. I think the, uh, the uh, English Standard Version, which is here uh, in the Lutheran Study Bible, and you can get many different editions of the English um, Standard Version. Uh, hi, Rita, Tim. But um, I think they've, they've got it right here, in Jesus' words. Uh, let, me, let me read you what I think is a bad translation uh, of this particular passage in the New Revised Standard Version. When uh, Jesus is asked by the disciples who sinned this man or his parents, Jesus answered, according to the NRSV, neither this man nor his parents sin. He was born blind so that while it is uh, so that 
I'm sorry, so that God's works might be revealed in him. So uh, some of these translations seem to indicate that God intentionally blinded this man so that Jesus could do this sign. I don't think that's faithful either to the Greek in which this gospel was written, uh, nor is it faithful to what we know about God and his theology. And so the ESV says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, Jesus says, forget about trying to assign blame, right? And we tend to do that. We want to blame people for their own problems all the time rather than simply looking for ways in which we might be able to do the work of God. We might be able to love God, love neighbor, provide help, hope, healing, whatever it might be. So Jesus is saying, you know, don't stand back from this man judging him, right? That's a non-issue. That's not for you to decide anyway. But what I'm going to do now is in the midst of this I'm going to give you a sign of my power over things that afflict the human race because of the condition of sin, which means we are all mortal, all susceptible to germs and disease and degeneration, etc. And uh, then the next thing he says in verse four, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So again, we have the image of light and dark, night and day here. Jesus is saying, while it is light, we must do God's works. And of course, I go back to once again, John 6, verse 29. Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And we're going to see... Um, a kind of enacted parable, a living parable of, of, of Jesus having been sent by the Father in what comes next. Hi, Jenny, I see you there. Welcome. So uh, Jesus says that as long as he's in the world, he's the light of the world. And uh, so we have that imagery again. And then he says, and then we're told in verse four, having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Now, <clears throat> it's the Sabbath. In fact, um, uh, my mentor, Pastor Shine, says that this miracle was performed right by uh, the section of the temple from which um, the, the trumpets announcing the beginning of the saliva, uh, saliva the beginning of the Sabbath, um, is taking place. So Jesus is well aware of what time it is. The Pharisees had a list of something like 39 rules of forbidden behaviors on the Sabbath, one of which was, um, I'm holding up my hand here, I don't know if you, kneading things in, in your hand, the palm of your hand, K N E A D I N G. And so he, he picks up this uh, dirt or clay from the ground, uh, spat on the ground, and he made mud with the saliva. <clears throat> now, there are echoes here of God creating humanity in the first place. Hi, Steve Dravis. It's good to see you. Steve uh, is a member of the parish I served Back in ancient times, Steve, when you were in catechism class with me, uh, 1984 to 1990. Uh, I'm glad to see you here tonight. So Jesus creates this clay compound. Um, he's creating something from this uh, dust. And then he anoints the man's eyes with this mud. And he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The word in the original um, Hebrew is, I think, Shiloah, uh, and it means sent. This is really important because Jesus has been sent from the Father, and Jesus in turn sends us. This pool 
um, is associated with uh, Isaiah and Isaiah's martyrdom, and it's fed by springs, and uh, you can probably read details on that. So uh, in, in a in a Bible atlas or something, but this contrasts with the pool at which the paralyzed uh, in which the paralyzed man in John five was healed. And uh, this man represents a marked contrast to the uh, uh, the healed paralytic in John chapter five. And we'll see why in just a few moments. Uh, as soon as Jesus tells this man to go wash his eyes in the pool, he does so. Verse 8. Uh, and it says he came back seeing. Verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Now, he really does stand out in contrast with the man in John 5, he, he doesn't want to even acknowledge that Jesus did this thing. And th this man says, Jesus did it. I don't know where he's at right now, but he did this thing. And um, he insists that he is the person, that Jesus is the, uh, that he is the person, the blind person who has been healed by Jesus. And I love this man because he is totally honest. He is totally without guile, like Nathaniel. You remember Nathaniel was mentioned in John chapter 1. Uh, Jesus says to him, here it is truly an Israelite with no guile. In other words, he's not trying to fool you, right? He is who he is. He is exactly who he claims to be, and he doesn't lie about things. The blind man sees more clearly who Jesus is than the healed paralytic. And what we're going to see throughout the gospel, uh, uh, throughout the chapter, chapter nine here, is that this man, as he's hit with skepticism and doubt, even from the rulers of Israel, he becomes more and more certain of who Jesus is. His faith and his witness escalate. He's like the woman in uh, at the well in John four, who. She goes through a progression of understanding more and more of who Jesus is. This man sees, and John wants you to be able to play with that imagery. The blind man sees. I was blind, but now I see. Now you know where John Newton got the phrase for the, the hymn Amazing Grace. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. They find this very troubling that this man is blind. They, they take him to the authorities. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such thing, uh, such signs? And there was a division among them. Once again, Jesus brings division. Um, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said he, ha he is a prophet. So now you see he's escalated like the woman at the well to believe it that Jesus must be a prophet. In the meantime, the Pharisees and presumably the crowds who brought the, the formerly blind man to them are failing to see what this sign points to. And they're getting lost in this issue of whether or not Jesus uh, should have done this on the Sabbath day. Notice they do not dispute that he has restored the blind man's sight. At least some of them don't dispute that. Some of them try to say it's not really the guy who was blind or he never really was blind or, or whatever. 
But at the core of it, there is a ref there there is this idea that yeah he did this thing, um, he performed this sign, but he can't be from God because he did it on a Sabbath day, as though God would not do good for the human race on the Sabbath. And of course, um, as as Lutherans, we believe that the Sabbath is not so much about the day, particularly since uh, Jesus has come into the world and uh, done all that's necessary for our salvation. Remember, and the third commandment, we're told, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What does this mean? Luther says, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise his word and the preaching of it, but acknowledge it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. So here, Luther is echoing what Jesus says about the Sabbath being made for the benefit of humanity. Humanity isn't made to be subservient to a Sabbath day. So uh, the point is that if you respect the word of God, uh, you're honoring the Sabbath, whatever the day may be, because the, the Sabbath was originally set aside as a day for us to focus on the word of God, the truth of God. All right. So they're not keeping the main thing, the main thing. Now, the man has escalated his witness for Jesus in front of the authorities, and that would have been a kind of frightening thing for someone who had spent his life as a blind man beggar. Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received the sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said th these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. To be put out of the synagogue, the Greek word in um, the New Testament, which you know all the New Testament was written in Greek, um, the Greek word is ek balo. It's a compound word. Ek means out. Balo means throw. So uh, they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue. In other words, they would no longer be considered part of God's people. This is excommunication. They were threatening excommunication from the Jewish faith if anyone confessed that Jesus is the Christ, and they don't want any part of it, even if their own son has been um, healed by Jesus with his sight restored. So, you know, they, they let their son go out there on a limb to confess his belief that Jesus is a prophet, and then they take out a saw and saw off the limb. He's old enough to answer for himself. We don't know how he was... You know, they, they, how he came to have sight again. They're not willing to even entertain publicly the confession that their son is making about Jesus. This man is alone, or so he fe may, may feel, at least in terms of the Jewish faith, he is alone. Um, in, in terms of that moment, and sometimes we can feel that way when we go out on a limb and trust in Christ and others are telling us we're crazy. All right, verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Again, this, this shows this man's guile, uh, guilelessness rather, that he is without guile. Look, I don't know all about your fancy theological arguments. What I know is that Jesus came to me and I now see. I think there are a lot of theological arguments that happen in the church that 
could be settled if we simply paid attention to what the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament, and Jesus himself have to say. Um, you can bring up all your arguments. One thing I do know is that I've come into the presence of Jesus and he's done this for me. Notice that the man is not, at this point anyway, railing against anyone. His argument is not, you people must be crazy. He's saying, this is what I know. I've encountered Jesus, and this is what has happened. There was a, uh, an ancient uh, church father named Polycarp who was executed for his faith in Christ. He was told to renounce Christ. Um, and uh, I can't remember when Polycarp lived. I think it was in the fourth century. But he, he talked about how many years Christ had been good to him and he would not turn away from Christ then. It was a very simple witness. And we have a very simple witness from this once blind man. Verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to your eye, do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now, I really think he made that comment innocently. They don't take it that way. Um, and they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. Remember, in John 8, Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe in me because Moses pointed to me. Uh, we believe in Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And remember, that was the issue last night. Because they refuse to believe that Jesus could be from God, they don't know where it comes from. Verse 30, the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where it comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. In other words, they excommunicated him. Now notice he hasn't gotten to the point of proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, but he is at the point of saying, this man must be from God. This miracle is so remarkable. I've never heard of anything like this being done, he's saying. He must be from God. And he says in verse 31, We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Remember in James 5, 16, James says that the prayer of a righteous person, that is someone made, by right, made righteous by faith through Christ, the, 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 the prayers of a righteous person are powerful. In fact, I like the translation of that that's rendered in the contemporary English version. Uh, the whole verse, it's James 5, 16. It says, if you have sinned, you should tell each other, what you've done, then you can pray for one another and be healed. The prayer of an innocent person is powerful and it can help a lot. So this man saying, Jesus must be innocent. He must be righteous because God the Father is hearing his prayers. And then remember in John uh, 14, 13, if you want to take a look at that real quickly, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In other words, God loves to hear the prayers of those who are made righteous through Jesus. And here the man is saying, Jesus uh, derived his power from God the Father. God the Father must be listening to him. He must be from the Father. And for that, he is thrown out of the synagogue. And he says, if this man, in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. 
Jesus will say in John 15, verse uh, 5, without me, you can do nothing. So this all engages the power of God and underscores the idea that Jesus is God in the flesh. All right, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He invests so much credibility in Jesus' words. He's basically saying, If you tell me who he is, I will believe in him. He answered, uh, I'm sorry, verse 37. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, the blind man saw. And it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This man has now gone from just knowing what Jesus had done to saying he's a prophet, to saying he's come from God, to saying he is God because he worshiped him. It would have been sacrilege for him to worship Jesus if he weren't God. And these are the kinds of people that Jesus associates with. People who the religious authorities may say, mm, they're not of God. Jesus embraces. And they look past all of the authoritarian accretions that people add to Christian faith to see Jesus himself and worship him as their God. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus says earlier in the gospel that he's not the one who judges us. We judge ourselves on the basis of the standards we establish. If our standards are that we are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone, we judge no one. And we don't cast judgment on ourselves because we know, as Luther said, in the last sermon he preached before he died, we are all beggars. We are all saved by grace. None of us can claim to be better than anybody else. Um, and so um, Jesus is saying, you know, when he comes into the world, he is the one that creates judgment because of our decision about who he is. Will we bow down to him as Lord or will we claim, no, we, we follow Moses. We follow Paul. We follow Apollos, right? We follow Joel Osteen. We follow uh, Franklin Graham. No, we follow Jesus. Uh, and if we follow anyone or anything besides Jesus, we are casting judgment upon ourselves. And then there's this whole business about seeing and not seeing. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, let me read that to you. You might want to turn to it. Genesis 3, verse 7. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam is with Eve when she has her dialogue with the serpent in the garden. Verse 7, then after they bit into the fruit, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Um, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The ancient rabbis, many of them, believed that Adam and Eve had been born blind. And that when they bit into the fruit, disobeying God, their eyes were opened. Before they were in a, a, a position of utter dependence on God who led them. Now they see 
they see that they're naked. They were not conscious of that before. They were not conscious that they could misuse their lives. Now they know good and evil. Their eyes were open, just as the serpent said that their eyes would be opened and they would know good and evil. To know both good and evil and not just good alone is a curse. And the human race has operated on it ever since. Now, in this miracle, in John chapter 9, we have a kind of reversal of that. Here is a man born blind, in, in, born into a world... Um, into the world under the condition of sin. But when his eyes are opened, he sees Jesus. He sees the God from whom Adam and Eve had hidden themselves. And he falls down in worship, not only in obeisance and, and, and worship, but in total submission. The very submission from which Adam and Eve had allowed themselves to be lured away. They thought that they were gaining freedom. And what they gained was death. And the imprisonment of sin from which only Jesus can free us. And so Jesus tells these Pharisees. If you were blind, you would have no guilt. Adam and Eve had been blind. They had no guilt. They saw only good. They didn't see good and evil. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The irony about their seeing is that they do not see. They refuse to see that Jesus is God in the flesh, that Jesus is Lord. And so at the end of this chapter, we have this remarkable witness by the man once born blind, but we also then who was born blind. And now we also have a rising crescendo of opposition to Jesus and Jesus becoming more and more direct in confronting people. Um, if you have the time, it would be worth your while at some point to go back and look at John 5 then read John 9 again and see the contrast between the former paralytic, cunning, self-serving, subservient to earthly power, trying to escalate himself in the world and compare and contrast him to the man born blind, humble, and overt about his witness for Jesus, open, pliant, pliant in the hands of God, and um, utterly trusting in Jesus. I'd rather be like the man in John 9 than the man in John 5. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, make us open to you. Help us turn away from evil, from looking upon it or considering it. Help us to turn away from selfishness and self-aggrandizement and selfish ambitions, and instead to turn to Jesus to humbly bow at his feet, to acknowledge him as Thomas will in John chapter 20 as my Lord and my God. We pray, Lord, that our lives will reflect this humble submission to you so that like the formerly blind man, we can be innocent and straightforward truthful and kind and considerate as we share Jesus with others, but firm and strong as you empower us to be firm and strong in our faith in you. 
Lord, once again, we lift up to you all of those who have been victimized by this uh, coronavirus. We pray that you would bring healing. We pray that you would bring comfort to the families of those who have died. We pray that that curve will be flattened, not only here in the United States, but around the world, that you will um, protect first responders and doctors and nurses and all healthcare workers from this disease, and that you will speed the day uh, when researchers will be able to produce treatments and a vaccine. Lord, I ask your blessings on us tonight as we contemplate the death of our Lord Jesus on the cross, knowing that he has died for us and that he makes us new as we trust in him. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for joining me tonight. God bless you. And uh, I will see you on Monday night when we will look at John chapter 10. God bless.